California yeah. for over a year and a half. She is super sharp at team nails the online assignments. So okay. She'll, just, she'll videotape a video of herself giving the final project. Okay. All right, so let's start. Uh, this is the Art of Communication, class number one. Uh, my name is Bob Nunn. So we'll begin. Uh, let's pray. Father, we are grateful believers in Jesus, and we thank you so much. Uh, Lord, you said this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm grateful for the, I'm grateful for the uh, school. I'm grateful for Marvin, uh, for just all of the team. I'm grateful for our church that's behind uh, educating the flock. Uh, Lord, I'm grateful. I just pray for all of the teachers, even Pastor uh, Chris, uh, Sam, who I don't know who else is teaching, but Lord, just anoint them. Let them speak with boldness and peace and a focus and uh, let chains be broken. And uh, Lord, you said my people perish for lack of knowledge. So I pray that would be imparted upon them. Lord, speak through me. Uh, a clarity of vision in Jesus name. Amen. amen. Okay, so my name is Bob Nunn. Most of you know me. I've, I've been a, a teacher here for quite a long time. Uh, I have my master's level. Uh, eventually we'll get my PhD. I'm working on it. Uh, this class is about uh, public speaking. Now I'm going to I'm going to pass out the I'm going to pass out this and just check your name, check your name. Uh, and uh, this right here, I should go over the requirements. Does everybody have a syllabus? Okay, so right over there, you have to read the textbook. So please don't just do the, because it's open book, read the book because this is good for every aspect of life, not just Bible, but if you have to do presentations, uh, it's a great book. Uh, I think you will learn a lot. I, I've read it three or four times. I, I really enjoy it. I enjoy it, I enjoy it every time that I read it. Uh, so you have to participate in all the classes, listen to any missed classes. So you're going to create topics from supplied scriptures using me, we, God, you, we. And I will go over that. I will go over that uh, tonight. And again, I'll go over it twice. The basic premise of the book is uh, uh, for writing sermons is uh, me, we, God, you, we. And uh, it's super easy. Uh, I want you to listen to your favorite preacher and kind of create a template describing his preaching style because there's there's three there's three basic styles there's textual okay which you take a text okay. mm -hmm. and they expand upon it and uh, there's a lot of people around here that do that style mm -hmm. uh, there's topical which is a topic wow. and then there's uh, expository uh, the expository is a group of scriptures and you get the meaning which i'll go over more you get the meaning from the text that's expository textually mm -hmm. you're going to use less scripture but the scripture is going to be the focus of the subject uh, topical you use the topic you use the scripture to kind of prove your topic whatever it is you know sermon series on depression or fear or addiction or divorce or some or honesty or character so the topic is just a topic and the scripture is it proves your subject textual where you're looking at a brief Specific. just a few uh, sentences or maybe one or two verses and then you're going to springboard uh, to prove like a proof text and then expository is where you exegete or just you draw out so the whole thing is based you let the word and uh, one thing that's I want to caution you is that uh, although the premise of the class or a uh, highlight is the 
Andy Stanley method, the one point message, which I'll go over later on. Uh, it's not the only message. It's not the only style. There's no style that's bad. If anybody says, uh, well, the only way to study the Bible is verse by verse and everything else is from the devil. No mature Christian is going to say that because there's times where you could just exegete the Bible from 10 verses and that's what you're going to do because in a situation or you're going to have a topic because you have to go to your audience, whatever your audience. I mean, you're not going to talk about farm equipment to uh, airplane salesmen and vice versa. You're not going to talk about airplanes unless crop dusters. You're not going to talk about uh, the uh, po uh, movie popcorn to farmers. Right, you know what I'm saying? You got to you got to look at your audience, whatever your audience is. And so all three are good. And it's just a sign of immaturity uh, on the person that berates a different style, because what you really want to do is effectively touch people. So with that being said, uh, you're going to listen to your favorite preacher and create a template describing your preaching style. And uh, if you need some, you, you know, at the break or something, you can come up to me if you need to ask a question about that. Just whoever you like, just listen to them and try to figure out what you know. What are they? Are they teaching a topic, or they're a textual, or they're you know, are they teaching a verse by verse study? I mean, if you went up to Calvary, that's what that he would be teaching all the time. What uh, kind of form are you want? Are you wanting us to like outline? Yeah, an outline. outline exactly. The preacher's yeah. message. And, yeah. Just tell me what he's. What, what, you okay? This guy. My my guy is Judas Smith, or my guy is Stephen Furtick, or my guy is Robert Morris. You know, Robert Morris is always two scriptures, one from the old, one from the new, a three-point sermon, something like that. Just oh. something like that. That's what you're gonna gonna go over. Okay. Uh, it, there's a reason for that because okay. it'll help you to do your outline. So the next thing is to create three sermon outlines: one that's topical, and we'll go over all this. One is textual and one is exegetical or expository. And then perform a 10-minute ten, ten sermon with no notes. And you go, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll study. So, just to give you uh, the calmness, is that, uh, have you been on vacation anytime soon? Yes. When's the last time you've been on vacation? Just last week. Okay. Could you talk 10 minutes about your vacation? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, what about something that you struggled with and then you had victory over? Could you talk about that? All right. Could you talk about maybe the struggle that you had with your child or your husband? Or you could talk about a victory uh, that you had. It would be easy. You wouldn't know. You would need some some uh, three by five index cards to get you a notes and like maybe I could maybe I would let you give one and I'll talk to you about this later maybe one three by five index card for the opening the closing because that's all that really needs to get you started you get started on your point and then you're off you go and then you land the plane right so it's not as hard as you might think and plus 10 minutes is not a is, oh my gosh I can talk for three hours. <laughs> yeah. So I'm telling you, it's easier to talk for 20 minutes than 10. Yeah. Because 10 is like, I'm just getting warmed up. I'm not even finished my, like, what? I've been talking for nine minutes right now. Right? So it's really simple. So I don't think we have any graduate students here. Okay. So the book, uh, the book is this one. It's super. The first part of it is kind of a narrative. It's about this dude that's a terrible preacher. He hates it, and he's going on this journey, and he goes to this truck driver. And the whole and the book is the first part of the book is about that, and it's a fantastic read. And so, uh, and then the second part is more nuts, nuts and bolts. All right, so let's get started. If you just everybody's got their thing, no. Uh, oh, maybe I should go over the grading. Well, you see it right. Read. It's fifteen percent. Participating in the classes which create uh, 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 topics is 15%. Listen to your favorite preacher and create a template is 10%. Create three three sermon outlines. Now, don't just 
find them somewhere because I, I I can tell. Just create them yourself, so because you need to learn how to do that. And then the I I took the pressure off you because the sermon is only thirty percent, right? And uh, it's basically yes, sir. Like, what are you talking about? Tell me, who taught you that? What? Yeah, what was it? Tell me, tell me about it. Yeah, it's probably the same thing. Yeah, because this is standard for a lot of, the, you know, for what we do here. I think he's asking if he could use the same subject that he used in another class. Not necessarily the subject, but just for the great great sermon outline. So so uh, okay so a sermon outlay like if you had if you went to college and you had a paper uh, of the basic five paragraph paper how, how does it go okay. intro body closing right five paragraph okay so basically every sermon is introduction main part conclusion and then inside of that You'll learn that these different have different things, you know, inspiration, application, demonstration, all, all sorts of things. Bless you. So let's just let's get let's get on our on our way. And I can't teach everything in, in nine minutes, but it'll, it'll be it'll be self-explanatory. All right. So Jesus is our master preacher. He's organized in thought and presentation. Uh, what I like about it, and what I, what what I try to do in my sermons is uh think about this 20 percent of the audience in church are heathens or don't know anything about they're just checking us out and not not that it's a bad word that that's even a christian word 20 percent of the people are just checking us out seekers don't not christians 20 percent are old school christians right the rest of the 60 percent what i would be called are uh, immature Christians, not from a negative, just, you know, not very biblical, knowledgeable, right? So what I want you to think about is when you're doing stuff, if you see, if you see a word that's Christianese, because we've got our own, we got our own language, right? Take it out and put in a word that they can understand because you just lost 80% of your audience because they do not know what sanctification means. They don't know what redemption means. They don't know what conviction, the difference between conviction and condemnation means. They don't know what hallelujah means. They don't know what amen means. They don't know what hosanna means. So if you said amen, it would be really simple in your talk to say, you know, in Christianity, amen kind of means so be it, or I agree with it. So now they understand, oh, now, now I know what he's saying, instead of just assuming. So have an eye with, that I want you to preach the sermon like I am not a Christian. Okay? I want you to preach a sermon to the people when you get up here. So don't stray from the Christian values because Jesus never, but you know what? What did Jesus do? When he was talking to farmers, he talked about seeds. When he was talking about fishermen, he talked about fish. When he was talking about tax collectors, he talked about money. The language they understand. Exactly. You know what? A lot of times when God speaks to me, he sounds a lot like me. Why? Because he's speaking my language. He's through my, 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 my soul, my body, soul, and spirit. So he has my flavor. Now, if he's going to talk to somebody who's French, he probably would speak French. If he's talking to somebody who's African, he's probably speaking an African dialect because God meets us where we are. That's what's so beautiful about him. Y'all with me? Okay. So uh, he often uses uh, discerning illustrations. He, uh, he uses visual aids and demonstrations. Visual aids and demonstrations are always great, right? I mean, gosh, how many things over the course of our church, my church history here, have they done? Crazy stuff. I remember one time the greatest <laughs> was they had this, uh, I think a little saucer, like a flying saucer with a Bible attached to it, and it dropped down 
and it came this close from hitting Pastor Dan on the head. It was pretty heavy. It was scary. I, I mean, I laughed. And then he got kind of mad because everybody was laughing. But it was really super funny. Uh, but, the, you know, through the course of time, there's always... I'm telling you, it was a couple yeah. years ago, right? It was super funny. But they do a lot of crazy stuff, and you, remi- you, re- you, re- you remember that stuff. Because we need it. We need, you know... I always say the Bible is a children's book, and we love pictures. Children's book always has pictures, right? Uh, and even the other ones have, like... Uh, puzzle, puzzle pieces like two puzzle pieces and you just put it in there and fit together and then it's a book and it's like it, we have to make it easy so when you're speaking make it easy make it understandable so remember 80% of your audience do not know what you're talking about if you go Christian only 20% of those people and those people do, probably don't care they just want to know when they can get out to go to you know Cracker Barrel so because uh, they've heard it all before so it has to be inspirational so if it's something that you can connect with them, it'll be more in tune to be inspirational. And that's what Jesus did, right? Uh, he always delivered a timeless message relevant, relevant to every generation. That's what I love Jesus. That people say the Bible is not relevant. It's relevant today. Uh, everything, it is. It's just how we look at it and how we present it, right? If we start presenting it in the King James English, it's not going to be relevant. But there's so many different translations. You know the difference between a translation and a transliteration, right? The passage, the message, those are transliterations, not actually... The translation uses the actual Hebrew and Greek. Right. So like the New King James, the King James, maybe the American Standard, those are all translations. You know, and that's my next class that I'm going to be teaching is hermeneutics. And it's that's how to study the Bible through a, a scientific process. Uh, it's a different class. But we're not going to go into that here. This is just the construction of the talk. All right. So uh, uh, his word was backed up by actions. So, boy, that does that put pressure on us to take action? And so, like, I love, love, love what what our church has done this year because it absolutely makes sense, and it makes sense to hear is that one step. I so love that because you know. This whole book is about one idea. And I want you, when, I, when you're going to go, this whole uh, type of how to teach is one thing. Because how, how many things are you going to remember? I can meet you on the church steps and say, what did the pastor say? He was great, but gosh, I, I can't think of it. Right? But one, one thing, if you can just make one thing, one I step. You did a really good illustration yes. Or a story. Or the story that related to the biblical thing. And it goes, gosh, I can't believe it. You know, he was selling drugs and then he did this and gave his heart to Jesus or or some kind of thing. Or his, well, it still amazes me that Kevin used to... <laughs> oh, grow, what, grow his pot up on the roof. Yeah, grow exactly. his pot up on exactly. the roof. I mean, you know. See, uh, the most important thing, what you want to do is find out, remember who you're talking to. And tension creates... Attention. If you can create tension, asking a question, what would you do? Raise your voice. Pause. Uh, and this whole thing is not, it's not like theatrics, but it's kind of theatrical, right? It's not a performance, but it is a performance because what you're doing is taking the word of God and trying to effectively communicate. And you're doing, remember, you're doing your part and then you're going to trust God to do your part. Uh, uh, T.D. Jake said this. Remember this, because this is good. Right? Uh, study till you're full. Think till it's clear. Pray till you're hot. Trust and let go. That's what you need to do. So you're responsible for three of those, aren't you? You're responsible to study till you're full. Like right now, I've probably got 25 hours in this. I'm full. I could preach for six hours on this right here. I've only got three, but I'm full, right? I have studied till I'm full. I've thought about it. I've listened to other sermons. I went and took the class over again and listened to Pastor Matt teach it two years ago. 
because I wanted to I wanted to think until I was clear. Hey, was that a good point? Should I use that? That's good. Should I use that example? Is this good? Is that good? I thought until it was clear. I had a clear pathway. This is exactly what I'm going to do. And sometimes you have a thought of what you're going to do, but it's not clear what, what happens. It's muddled, right? It's muddled. So you got to study till you're full. You got to think till you're clear. Then you have to pray till you're hot. Hot. Pray till you're hot, till you're passionate, because people want passion when you get up here. You pray that the Holy Spirit, hey, what does the Holy Spirit do? What does God do? He, right? He takes the wood and goes like this. Right? And he blows in the fire. You know, it says in Leviticus, it says, put wood, your humanity. Wood in the Bible speaks of humanity. Wood speaks of our sin. It says, don't let the fire go out, but put wood on the fire every single day. If I'm praying and God's revealing stuff, I said, Lord, take that, take that, take this, take that. And then God blows on it. And then your spirit, when you come in here, it's going to be, it's going to be on fire. That's how you get on fire. Give, get, make sure that it says, don't let ever, don't ever let the fire go out. How do I let the fire go out? I, Lord, I don't want my fire to go out. Put wood on it. Put your humanity. Put your sin on it. The, the only responsible response that what you can do to your sin is to put it on the fire. Give it to the Lord. And then he consumes it. And it, 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 it's, it's the thing that moves you. All right. And so tension creates attention. All right. So uh, the next thing we got is... I'm trying to go by the notes. I've determined myself that I'm going by the notes. Uh, Jesus, he waited for his father's approval. So what we're going to do is... All right. When I, when I have a script... Does everybody got a Bible? Get your Bible out. Get your sword out of your sheath. A uh, few millennials, to, uh, get your instrument. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a millennial, but I got it. So when I, uh, what I want you to do is, okay, so, uh, okay, first of all, if anybody has trouble reading or feels uncomfortable, just, just pass, okay? Because I don't want to, if you, like, maybe you, you have trouble with reading, you're dyslexic or anything, I'm very sensitive to that. So if, if you, I don't want to embarrass anybody if they struggle with reading, uh, if it takes a long time, just, just pass, okay? So, uh you know, I don't want to draw the attention, but so I want you to stand up. OK, we'll go. We'll start here and we'll go around. Stand up and I want you to read when I'm going to give you scriptures throughout this thing. We stand up and read and I want you to pause where you need to pause. I want you to change inflection. I want you to be confident. I want you to uh, maybe upgrade the volume on on the most correct word. Uh, if there's a semicolon or a comma, I want the pause is the best. The best is a pause. You know, those preachers that just like, they'll just stop speaking. And you're like, what, what, what does that do? That creates tension. Tension creates what? Attention. Create attention. Create tension to get attention. The pause, the increase of volume. Uh, the fact that I'm enthusiastic, be enthusiastic. Be confident. Listen, most times people are confident when they're selling. They have no clue what they're selling, but you believe them because they're confident. Right? It's all about confidence. Better right? They sell you. Exactly. <laughs> Ma'am, I got three other people looking at this car. I know. <laughs> all right. So the first one is Luke 3, uh, 21 and 22. And then the next one will be, right? You? Right. Yeah. Uh, it will be Matthew 9, 35, and then Matthew 36, and then Matthew 14, 14. And then... Okay, 9.36? Yes. Okay, just one verse. Yeah, and then, uh, Casey, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And Nick, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Five nineteen. 5.19. thank you. All right, you all ready? 16. What? I said it was confidently read the wrong one. What? I said it was confidently read the wrong one. It doesn't matter. If you read the wrong one, I would have still... Okay, and also, when after everybody speaks, I want everybody to uh, give them some love, okay? We're going to give them some love. We're going to clap for them, okay? No. So, you ready? Okay. No, 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 no. No, no, I got it. No, Luke 3, 21 and 22. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Be bold, sister. All right. Be bold. bold. All right. Now, when all people were baptized... 
And when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him boldly, uh, on him bodily, in a bodily form, like a dove. And the voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Okay, so you stumbled over the one word bodily, uh, okay? Right, because my, it, it, it cut out. And I right, know. so we what we do is that for you other people, read it, read your thing before so you're comfortable. So that's what I would do. And when anytime I'm reading it, I try to memorize it. But if I'm like, especially if you come up here and you got one scripture or two scriptures, you should have been studying. Remember, study f- full. You should know the scripture and knows if you stumble on it, you go, I got to make sure I remember. But there's things like names. Oh my gosh, I love that app on the Bible where you can hit it and it's and the English dude says the name and I can kind of hit it a couple times and get the guy's name or if it's in Greek, if I want to do the Greek or Hebrew or something, I, I want to listen to it so I can try it or a, a name of a city or a person, you know, so uh, that's just, it was good. It was good. So, Thank you. All right, so, uh, so what did Jesus wait for? He waited for his father's approval. How old was how old was that character when Jesus said that when God said that to him? Anybody want to take a guess? When God said that to him in Luke, how old was Jesus? How long was right because his ministry was how long? 3 years. When did he die? 33. Back it up. This is the start of his ministry. He waited and did nothing for 30 years. They had a look at me in the church. What's wrong with them? They can't see my gift. I'm clearly supposed to be a preacher. I'm called by God. The whole virgin birth stuff. How come they're not paying attention to me? He didn't say that. He he, he, he wasn't a carpenter. You know that. They didn't have wood. He was a stone builder. He was a builder. In the original, it's a builder. He was actually more of a stone builder. But... Uh, so he worked in his father's shop or he was a businessman or he did whatever his dad. Usually they do what their father does. So there's evidence that he was in obscurity and was just an obedient kid and went to went to uh, uh, went to a uh, temple for 30 years. But. No. Well, no, he was just talking with the character, the guys. What the point is this is that. He was in relative obscurity for 30 years, but then God said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. Why was he pleased? Because he was obedient. That's a whole sermon right there. God's just pleased with us if we're obedient, right? So he, did, he started it when he was obedient. So Jesus' source and his goal was to be obedient to the Father. In the garden, he says, I only do the Holy Spirit. I, I only do what Jesus tells me to do. Jesus says, I only do what the Father does. So I wait to get orders from headquarters. So when you, before you start, get some kneel, some praying time to find out, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? What, what one of my struggles do you want me to, what one of my wounds, what one of my ugly scars do you want me to show to people? Right? Because your test is a testimony. Your mess is a message. You know, God get it says, uh, you know, that scripture that says God works all things together for good. Well, where you're going through it, it's not good. There's no part of it being good. Right. There's no part of it. I'm like, Lord, I am believing in faith that on the other side of this, you're going to get glory. And that's when you when you're going through it, you're just trusting him. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff will comfort me. When you get on the other side, then you then you can tell the other people going through the same thing, hey, good, this is what God did to me. He was with me. Sometimes he takes you out of the storm. Most of the time he takes you through the storm, right? Because I I, I used to hate this scripture, uh, you know, the Lord is a light into my path. Step by step, right? We have to step. I go, Lord, I want one of those floodlights, you know, because I just got 
that, like I'm, I'm doing a parable right now to try to teach a concept. I got one of these things in the hurricane, one of those headbands with the flashlights. You ever seen those? I got it. My wife, wife made big fun of me because she looks so stupid. And But, but it's hands-free now. Now I can like, I, and I go, I'm looking at them hands-free, right? And that's what I want in the, in the scriptures. I want it to be looked down the path so I can see, you know, a year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road. But he goes moment by moment. That's why you get grace. That's why he said the manna every single day. We have to go to him and receive our grace. Our grace is only, you know, grace is only good for a day. And then it's used up and you got to get more grace. And he goes, I rejoice over you with singing at night. It's like before he leaves, it's kind of like, you know, oh, here's your grace for tomorrow. When you wake up, I'm kissing you both sides of the cheek. And here's your grace for today. Because I don't have grace for tomorrow. And I don't have grace for uh, yesterday. I only have grace for today. I only have grace. I'm only living. God lives in the now. He's the now God, right? He's not the God of yesterday. Uh, he's, he's not the God of the past and he's not the God of the future. He's the God. He's always the, the now God. He operates in the now. Wherever he is, it's in the now. Time is in him. He's the now God. So he give us grace for now. So it's so important that Jesus modeled this, that he waited until God God wanted to do something, and then he act, He was activated. You want me to do what? I love this. In the scripture, in the, in the garden, he goes, I don't know if I can do this. Well, if you don't want to do it, you can walk away. It's okay. No, nevertheless, not my will. What was he? He waited for his father's approval. He goes, then he says, I'm ready. I love that in the Passion of the Christ when he went and then he got just before he got whipped, he goes, I'm ready. He was ready because he knew it didn't matter what they did to him. He was going to do what God wanted him to do. And he was ready. He goes, I'm ready. I just want to do what you want to do. And if I have to die for the sins to let every single everybody else walk in the blessings of Christ, then I'm going to do it. I'm ready to do it. So when we do stuff, when we speak, it should be, Lord, what do you want me to communicate to the people? So that's what he waited. That's so big. Okay, so the next one, Matthew 9, 35. Robust with feeling, please. And Jesus went about all the cities and all the villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching in their and teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing healing every sickness and every disease among the people Good job. Thank you. young lady but when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd at all so think oh <laughs> so when i think about that when he says move with compassion a great time you took a pause it was perfect oh, he was gosh. moved with compassion it's okay to pause because that is a that creates tension it's like he was moved with compassion right and so uh this is like the biggest thing because some people when they preach or get up and communicate are moved with other things what are some of those other things pride monetary money uh for attention or hey if they're codependent they their insecurity needs to be fed by approval by you saying i did a good job so I can feel good about myself. And it's not about you at all, but it's about me. That is so selfish. But when people are broken, that's, that is huge. I'm telling you, codependency is huge, uh, but that's good. Anything else? Why, what motivates people to get up and speak? We said monetary. You said pride. Pr which yeah. Would, yeah, that's not what I was thinking. Uh, what about Uncovering someone. Have we, have we ever been in a, in a uh, service where somebody is beating us over the head with a Bible? About, yeah. I mean, oh, that's old school. 
you don't hear it, see, you know, not in this church, but I've been in other churches where I felt ashamed or guilty. Well, my Bible says I'm not guilty. It even says the sinner. It says, for God so loved the world, right? So even sinners, sinners are not guilty if they accept the free gift of payment of what Jesus did on the cross. So our job is to say, you're not guilty. Somebody else has paid your price, right? So they don't even know that they're guilty. So all the shame that they have, right? But people do preach out of uh, shaming someone or guilt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's whole there's whole denominations that are based on that. Uh, but see, I believe that this is the only thing that should motivate anybody. Yes, you have a question? Oh, I think that should be that anything is love and compassion. Is love and compassion, and see the God kind of love that's not in the uh, it's in the Old Testament, but it's it's not in the New Testament. The word the Greek word is agape, right? And we know from other classes that that means a choice love, that I choose the Bible term for love in the New Testament is a decision. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, love is all of those are decisional adjectives. Don't you have to choose to be kind? You have to choose. You don't have to feel kindness, right? You know, you don't have to feel kindness. I feel your choice to be kind, but I don't have, I don't feel kind to be kind. I choose to be kind. You feel kindness from my choice. Does that make sense? Okay. Other attributes of love. Uh, keep no record of wrongs. Uh, I was listen, I was watching this show and uh, the one person apologized and the way they did it in this culture is that the person said, forgiven. They actually said that, forgiven. Like, you know, it was like a sentence. Will you forgive me? And they said, forgiven. And it was like, to me, it was so powerful. It's like, yeah. you know, it actually said it, you know, it's like, yeah, forgiven. I, I choose forgiveness. And so that's a choice, keeping no records. They'll bring it up. Empathy and compassion. Well, that's a choice. All, all attributes of love are cho a choice because the God kind of love is a choice love. So it has to be ch it has to be chosen. That's what God chooses. He says nothing that you can do can make make me love you more. So it's ch chosen. But it's, it's out of the con. I wanted to highlight that, but that's not the construct of the class. I, I don't want to get caught in there. Uh, OK, Matthew 14, 14. Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Awesome. Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> All right. You with me? Go ahead. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Bravo. Excellent. So, in our eyes of where we want to get up and stand in front of people, it should always be with love and compassion and to reconcile people. That should always be on your utility belt. Your Batman, your Jesus utility belt is love and compassion and reconciliation. So, have you ever noticed that no matter what the pastor is talking about at the end, they offer a reconciliation offering. They want to say, does anybody out there know, want to know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, you have an opportunity because this message, this topical message or this textual message or what I spoke for in the last 22 minutes, it's all about Jesus and you can have that, right? You know, the, the way you start to get it. And so that has to be very close on the surface. Very close on the surface is reconciliation. Always, Second Corinthians. Pardon me. Um, issues. Oh, just do it phonetically. Uh, all right. So. What, where you were ready to say Second Corinthians? Oh, five nineteen. What she what she was speaking on. Uh, uh, the next one is Mark sixteen fifteen through sixteen. And he said to them, As you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news. 
the gospel to the entire human race. Whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. Awesome. So, uh, this last one is that he always knew where he wanted, he was headed, and he took the people to the point of decision. Take the people to the point of decision. What's your one thing? They got to make a move. What's your move? What are you teaching them? Why are you teaching them? With love and compassion. They're reconciling something. They got something broken. You're trying to, through your own brokenness, you want to try to touch those, those people and make them make a move to take one step towards reconciling, right? That is power, that's transformation preaching right there. So it's really super important. All right, Mark 16, 17 through 18, and then you young lady will be 19, and then you young lady will be uh, Mark 16, 20. Off you go, robustly, with, fer with fervor. Mark si 16, 15 and 16, 17 and 18, 19, 20. Oh, Mark 16. New Testament. Second book uh, after Matthew. 16 verses. Uh, uh, chapter 16, 15 and 16. I'll tell you, you can read mine. That's a beautiful thing. This is the Holy Spirit Bible. So, okay. So when you read this, you'll be speaking in tongues or something. I don't know. What Crazy Bible. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be saved. What, didn't you just read that? I don't think he did. Did you? Mark 15 and 16. Oh, I'm sorry. To read 17 and 18. My bad. Okay. I thought I was hearing things. Lost my mind. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Bravo. All right, so now you're going to have to do 19. Off you go. Read, woman. That's what they do with it. Can I pre-read it first? No. Oh. You have to go. So then, after the Lord spoke unto them, he was received up into heaven. On the right hand of God. Good job. 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. Amen. So Amen. So, just that little bit, you made aware, you probably wouldn't have done that if I hadn't highlighted that on all those scripture readings. You, you have, when you read aloud, you change the cadence, the pace, the punctuation, you look for punctuation, you emphasize, you be confident when you're up there. So that has nothing to do with your message, but has everything with you to present the best picture. It's not like if you would be going out with a date with your favorite person, you would get pretty or get dressed up right if it's something special right put a new coat of paint on the barn or get a, a new exactly there you go or you had somebody special come i mean you would maybe vacuum the house or you would pre you know you have your go-to meal you know so like you're getting up front and you're representing as my sister said we are representing christ to the people and reconciling them for whatever hurt that that god is illuminated through it like we went through something now he wants us to share how we went through it so it would be a benefit to other people we need to present the best policy we're going to study hard we're going to think till it's clear we're going to pray till we're hot and then we're going to trust god and let go right and so 
we, we wouldn't we wouldn't just like come up and say oh i'm just gonna let the spirit that's ridiculous although you can you can be full and then the spirit will highlight stuff like sometimes i get up here and the, the lord will highlight stuff and it's like a blessing but i'm full because he says study till you're full think till it's clear pray till it's hot that's what i do and then when he gets up there the bible says oh don't worry when you get up and talk to men because you'll be pray you'll be studied till you're full uh, think till you're clear study till you're hot so don't worry just let go and trust god because i'll have so much information that i can pull it out and illuminate to you and you can just go you can just it'll just come out i'm just gonna i, I know i'm full i pray till i'm hot i thought it clearly i know the path i'm going to take and then i'm just going to trust god that's what he means that means being led by the spirit but you know, the world was formed by what? The words of God's mouth. So the Holy Spirit to work needs material. And so when you speak the word out of your mouth, that gives the Holy Spirit material to do something in your life. Does that make sense to y'all? Okay, good. All right. So we've got a few minutes. Uh, I'll just go. In, uh, oh, I should. I, I'm going to stop in one minute. Homiletics. Anybody know what homiletics is? Evidently, it's the yeah. art and science of preaching. Yeah. Uh, the, from the Greek, that word means to converse with. So basically, you're conversing with people about the Lord, right? Uh, it's the art and science of preaching. And you go, art and science, come on. The art is the personality, the voice, the delivery, the stuff that we can do, right? The science and the, it's the structure, like we talked about. Uh, the textual, the topical, the exegetical, or the expository, you know? So that's the science, the structure. Just like you do a term paper, five paragraph term paper, there's an intro, there's, a, there's the main, and then there's the conclusion. That is the science. The, the art is the, the, way, the way I am, the way that I use the, my, my jokes or my personal stories or my personal delivery. And don't try to be, everybody can't be T.D. Jakes, or everybody can't be Judah Smith, or everybody can't be Robert Morris, whoever your favorite preacher is, or everybody can't be Stephen Furtick. Who? Joyce Myers. Well, I have joy, and everybody can't be Joyce Myers. You, get, you know why? Because uh, it, it changed your life. Uh, <laughs> but what you can do is that I can be the best me. That's right. And what, what's it make to be the best me? I study till I'm full. I think till I'm clear. I pray till I'm hot. And then I trust God and let go. Y'all take your break. <laughs>